brothers and sisters. Welcome to another episode of Jesus Christ and His Second Coming. I'm your host, Spencer. And boy, do we have a classic talk to review today. This one is from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, entitled, Be Ye Therefore Perfect Eventually. Now, I just want to say that when you look at this talk, and this talk was given back in 2017, and you compare it to the last two talks that I just reviewed, one from Elder Kieran in 2024 and the other from Sister Eubank in 2019, over the years, there's still this consistent general message about us getting back home to our Heavenly Father and how we do that and how we handle and cope with the devastations of the world and, and grief and depression and anxiety and the fact that we are going to struggle in this life. We need to expect that if we haven't been expecting it already. Expect to have moments of trials and imperfections. I, I As I started rereading this talk, um, I immediately was taken back to hearing it the first time. I remember hearing this talk and just being taken aback and being reminded that <laughs> talks like this are what make Elder Holland, for me personally, one of my favorite apostles to listen to. I just love listening to him speak. And the world will experience a great loss when he, when he passes on to the other side of the veil. And so with that, I want to dive into this talk. I started reading through it going, okay, can I preface some of it? Can I, you know, skim over some of the parts to just kind of keep this talk down? And the reality is with an Elder Holland talk, you just can't. You, you can't really cut any of it out or you're going to miss some important context and some important details. So we're going to just go through this. Um, and I'm going to, one, as I go along, I, because we're online, I'm going to pull open the footnotes so you can see those footnotes that are the source material for his uh, sentiments or the, the the message that he's sharing. So as you're listening to any of this or, or watching this and you're going, well, where did he come up with that? Why is he saying it that way? And I do this in part because I have many people who listen to this channel who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And a lot of times they question uh, the source or the, the messages given during general conference. And so one way to help, you know, kind of respond to those questions is to show the source material that that the individuals are using uh, for their talks. So I'll pull those up as we go along. I'm not necessarily going to read every source material directly, but I'll at least put it on the screen so you can you can see it and you can go back and read it on your own accord uh, if you feel like you need to. So again, real quick, the title of this talk is Be Therefore Perfect Eventually. And it's dated October 2017. To start off, he says, The scriptures were written to bless and encourage us, and surely they do that. We thank heaven for every chapter and verse we've ever been given. But have you ever noticed that every now and then a passage will appear that reminds us we are falling a little short? For example, the Sermon on the Mount begins with soothing, gentle beatitudes. But in the verses that follow, we're told, among other things, not only to not kill, but not even be angry. We're told not only not to commit adultery, but also not even to have impure thoughts. To those for who ask for it, we're to give them our coat and then give our cloak also. We're to love our enemies, bless those who curse us, and do good to them who hate us. And if that is your morning scripture study and after reading just that far, you're pretty certain you're not going to get a good mark on your gospel report card, then the final commandment in the chain is sure to finish the job. Quote, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. With that concluding imperative, we want to go back to bed and pull the covers over our head. Such celestial goals seem beyond our reach. Yet surely the Lord would never give us a commandment he knew we could not keep. So let's see where this quandary takes us. Around the church, I hear many who struggle with this issue. Quote, I'm just not good enough. Quote, I fall so far short. Quote, I'll never measure up. I hear this from teenagers, from missionaries, from new converts, from lifelong members. In fact, one insightful Latter-day Saint, Sister Darla Isaacson, has observed that Satan has somehow managed to make covenants and commandments seem like curses and condemnations. For some, he has turned the ideals and inspiration of the gospel into self-loathing and misery-making. What I now say in no way denies or diminishes any commandment God has ever given us. 
I believe in his perfection, and I know we are his spiritual sons and daughters with divine potential to become as he is. I also know that as children of God, we should not demean or vilify ourselves, as if beating up on ourselves is somehow going to make us the person God wants us to become. No. With a willingness to repent and a desire for increased righteousness always in our hearts, I would hope we could pursue personal improvement in a way that doesn't include getting ulcers or anorexia, feeling depressed, or demolishing our self-esteem. This is not what the Lord wants for primary children or anyone else who honestly sings, I'm trying to be like Jesus. To put this issue in context, may I remind all of us that we live in a fallen world, and for now we are a fallen people. We are in the telestial kingdom. That is spelt with a T not a C. As President Russell M. Nelson has taught, here in mortality, perfection is still pending. And I'll call out real quick, this talk that he's referencing from President Russell M. Nelson was given all the way back in 1995. So this talk was given, uh, President Russell M. Nelson's talk was given 22 years earlier uh, about the notion that mortality and perfection is still pending. Back to the talk. So I believe that Jesus did not attend his sermon on this subject to be a verbal hammer for battering us about our shortcomings. No, I believe he intended it to be a tribute to who and what God the Eternal Father is and what we can achieve with him in eternity. In any case, I am grateful to know that in spite of my imperfections, at least God is perfect. That at least he is, for example, able to love his enemies Because too often, due to the natural man and woman in us, you and I are sometimes that enemy. How grateful I am that at least God can bless those who despitefully use him, because without wanting or intending to do so, we all despitefully use him sometimes. I really actually appreciate, to pause real quickly, the fact that Elder Holland acknowledges and calls out that, you know, when Christ talks about, you know, loving those who despitefully use you, he's actually also referring to us that there's many times when we willfully sin, we are despitefully using the Savior for his atonement, even though we are willingly and knowingly committing sin, and that we then turn around and look to him for forgiveness. You know, it, I think that's something that is a, is a good call out here. Uh, Moving on, I'm grateful that God is merciful and a peacemaker because I need mercy and the world needs peace. (laughs) And this again was in 2017. We're now in 2024. We need even more peace than we did seven years ago. Of course, all we say of the father's virtues, we also say of his only begotten son who lived and died unto the same perfection. I hasten to say that focusing on the father's and the son's achievements rather than our failures does not give us one ounce of justification for undisciplined lives or dumbing down our standards. No, from the beginning, the gospel has been for the perfecting of the saints till we come unto a perfect man under the measure or the, of the statue of the fullness of Christ. I am simply suggesting that at least one purpose of a scripture or a commandment can be to remind us just how magnificent the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ really is, inspiring us greater love and admiration for him and a greater desire to be like him. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him, Moroni pleads. Love God with all your might, mind, and strength. Then, by his grace, you may be perfect in Christ. Our only hope for true perfection is in receiving it as a gift from heaven. We can't earn it. Thus, the grace of Christ offers us not only salvation from sorrow and sin and death, but also salvation from our own persistent self-criticism. Let me use one of the Savior's parables to say this in a little different way. A servant was in debt to his king for the amount of 10,000 talents. Hearing the servant's plea for patience and mercy, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and forgave the debt. But then that same servant would not forgive a fellow servant who owed him 100 pence. Remember, 10,000 talents versus 100 pence. On hearing this, the king lamented to the one he had forgiven, shouldest not thou also have compassion on the fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? There is some difference of opinion among scholars regarding the monetary values mentioned here, and forgive the U.S. monetary reference, but to make the math easy, 
If the smaller unforgiven 100 pence debt were, say, $100 in current times, then the 10,000 talent debt so freely forgiven would have approached $1 billion or more. As a personal debt, that is an astronomical number, totally beyond our comprehension. Nobody can shop that much. Well, for the purpose of this parable, it's supposed to be incomprehensible. It's supposed to be beyond our ability to grasp, to say nothing of beyond our ability to repay. That is because this isn't a story about two servants arguing in the New Testament. It's a story about us, the fallen human family, mortal debtors, transgressors, and prisoners all. Every one of us is a debtor, and the verdict was imprisonment for every one of us. And there we would all have remained were it not for the grace of a king who set us free because he loves us and is moved with compassion towards us. Jesus uses an unfathomable measurement here because his atonement is an unfathomable gift given at an incomprehensible cost. That, it seems to me, is at least part of the meaning behind Jesus' charge to be perfect. We may not be able to demonstrate yet the 10,000 talent perfection the Father and the Son have achieved, but is not too much for them to ask us to be a little more godlike in little things? That we speak and act, love and forgive, repent and improve at least at the 100 pence level of perfection, which it is clearly within our ability to do. What I love that Elder Holland's doing here is he's saying, stop thinking that you're ever going to repay and reach this level of perfection in this life because it's impossible. It's If it were possible, we wouldn't need the atonement. We wouldn't need the Savior. It's impossible for us to do and especially for us to do now. But what the Lord is asking us to do is to step up our gain with what we are able to do. Be more kind, be more patient, be more loving, be more giving, be more charitable, be more all of these things. We do have that ability to step up our game now. And that's what the Lord is asking us to do. Going back to the talk. My brothers and sisters, except for Jesus, there has been no flawless performances on this earthly journey we are pursuing. So while in mortality, let's strive for steady improvement without obsessing over what behavioral scientists call toxic perfectionism. We should avoid that later excessive expectation of ourselves and of others, and I might add, of those who are called to serve in the church, which for Latter-day Saints means everyone, for we are all called to serve somewhere. In that regard, Leo Tolstoy wrote once of a priest who was criticized by one of his congregants for not living as resolutely as he should. The critic concluding that the principles of erring preacher taught must therefore also be erroneous. In response to that criticism, the priest says, Look at my life now and compare it to my former life. You will see that I am trying to live out the truth I proclaim. Unable to live up to the high ideals he taught, the priest admits he has failed. But he cries, Attack me if you wish. I do this myself. But don't attack the path I follow. If I know the way home, but am walking along it drunkenly, is it any less the right way simply because I'm staggering from side to side? Do not gleefully shout. Look at him. There he is crawling into a bog. No, do not gloat, but give your help to anyone trying to walk the road back to God. Brothers and sisters, every one of us aspires to a more Christ-like life than we often succeed in living. If we admit that honestly we are trying to improve, we're not hypocrites, we're human. May we refuse to let our own mortal follies and the inevitable shortcomings of even the best men and women around us make us cynical about the truths of the gospel, the truthfulness of the church, our hope for our future, or the possibility of godliness. If we preserve then somewhere in eternity our refinement will be finished and complete, which is the New Testament meaning of perfection. I testify of the grand destiny made available to us by the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself continued from grace to grace until his immortality, he received a perfect fullness of celestial glory. I testify that in this and every hour he is with nail-scarred hands, extending to us the same grace, 
holding on to us and encouraging us, refusing to let us go until we are safely home in the embrace of heavenly parents. For such a perfect moment, I continue to strive, however clumsily. For such a perfect gift, I continue to give thanks, however inadequately. I do so in the very name of perfection itself of him who has never been clumsy or inadequate, but who loves all of us who are even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, what a wonderful talk. Uh, A great reminder that, uh, you know, we should be on the path back home, but how many of us are walking along it drunkenly? What a fun uh, uh, metaphor. And I love the fact that he calls out, don't criticize the path simply because the person on it isn't walking it in a straight line. Brothers and sisters, take this talk to heart. Give yourself some grace here in the fact that you're not going to walk the path back home perfectly, but at least you're striving. And if you're not striving, start striving. Use your agency to change, to get back on that path. That path, as Elder Kieran shared in his his talk from the 2014 General Conference, that talk does not have intentional roadblocks on it set by God to try and stop us from getting back home. It's the complete opposite. That path is put there for us to be able to know how to get back home. I know that. I believe that to be true. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you've got anything else that you want to add, please do so in the comments. Leave your feedback. I really appreciate you tuning into this episode. Uh, As a reminder, liking, sharing, subscribing are all free ways that you can help show your support for this channel. Uh, It shows that to the algorithm that this is enjoyable content um, and will help it show up to more people. So please make sure that you're sharing it. And with that, we will see you in the next episode. Mm